everyone for coming. It's the last session of the day, so you must be quite tired. <laughs> but um, I hope that some of you will find some useful information in this. This is less geared towards the individual and more towards um, maybe companies that are looking to find some insights into their customers. But I hope that um, as a project, it'll also give you some insight in how to do this yourself and maybe start dabbling in machine learning yourselves. So after the at the end of the talk, I'll share some links where you can find the materials that I used and the code. And I hope that you can use this yourselves to go and get your hands dirty. And that whether you are an experienced data scientist or someone who's just kind of interested in the field, that you will all find something useful here. Just about myself, I'm uh, Cornelia van der Waals. I'm a data scientist at Superbalist. And I had to find some interesting insights into who our customers were. And I did this three times. I was like, OK, cool. I know what I'm doing now. Maybe I can go and talk about this at PyCon. So it's my first PyCon. And I was very excited. And then I realized, OK, we're in a merger right now. We have major competitors looking for our customer insights. I cannot show you guys this confidential information. So thanks to Helga, I got some some neutral data, some free data, and through sleepless nights and panic-induced coding, I managed to put together a never-before-seen project for you all. All right. Oh. Where is my cursor? So the session, we'll just be looking at an overview of how these projects are generally run. And hopefully, some of you who are new to this, perhaps you've been to a tutorial, perhaps this is the first time you're going to be introduced to the process. Hopefully, it'll just give you some insights to how we go through it. I'll look at some data prep, hopefully not for too long. And then at the algorithms and the nitty gritty, the fun part of tailoring your model, getting it to give you the insights that you want. And this is very much an individual, almost like an artistic thing. You, you know your, your field the best. You know your business the best. You know your prior. So you can make assumptions, and you can go and play around with the data and shift things around a little bit to get a better view of what's important to you. So the methodology that's often used here or that we used in particular, is you have to go and look into all the data that you have on your customers. And we like to use demographic as well as behavioral data. If you just look at behavioral, sometimes it doesn't tell you the whole story of the potential that a customer has to interact with your business. But sometimes the def demographic and behavior, they're different. Someone who might be quite wealthy might not be spending much with you because you're not really talking to them correctly. So you have to look at both sides to get the whole story. Then there's a lot of data prep. This is a huge part of the data scientist's work. To combine the data in a, in a sensible way, extract meaningful features, and then you have to turn all of that into numbers that your algorithm can crunch. Finally, you plug it in, that's step three, and then you analyze what you're getting out, and that should give you some actionable insights, things that you can use. That's what we really want here. All right, so what we're going to get out of this is a persona, right? When you have 500,000 customers, how do you speak to them? Who are they? That's very tough when you're trying to talk to this, this blob of people, faceless people. So clustering can turn them into kind of a condensed, generalized persona, a kind of a, a person with a personality who has certain preferences. And that helps you to target them when you're marketing, when you're engaging, when you're buying for them. There's a whole lot of things you can do with this information. For example, here we have two examples. On the left-hand side, you can see that uh, your one customer has a quite a big preference for the first category. So it would be quite sensible to promote that category to that, pr to that person. And that could be any kind of property that you can then help you engage with the customer. Sometimes these differences are not very clear cut. There's just like small differences, but it's in these slight changes where you can find that balance of who this person is as an overview. All right, let's get down to the code. All right. 
So this notebook, once again, will be shared with all of you. So I won't go into too much detail, but mostly we'll be using sklearn. And that's the algorithm that I've used the most and I'm the most comfortable with. So some data prep functions. We like to otherize our data, is what we call it in our group, where when you have, say, for example, everyone has a different city. That's one of your features. You might have something like 200 cities. How are you going to turn that into 200 features? That's maybe too much. Maybe you only care about the first five. So that this little function will just take out however many top um, values that you want, and you can replace it with either nan or some other string or value. And then dummies. So now we have our five cities, but how does the algorithm know what to do with London and New York and Tokyo? It doesn't. So you have to go and turn that into numbers, and it'll change that into kind of almost like a pivot where you have London with zeros, except for people who are in London, they get a one. And they do the same for Tokyo and New York and so on. And that's how the algorithm will, will then be able to interpret these categories. All right, so the data is also shared with you guys. This is the free data, and the link is there. So that you can go and play with this data yourself. The link is the raw data. So I left out a bunch of stuff, so you're welcome to go and look. Maybe something else is more interesting and you want to include it. 90% of a data science, maybe that's a little bit of an um, exaggeration, but a large part of your, your work as a data scientist is just prepping the data. So. Uh, there were some very valuable tutorials during the week. Andrew Collier gave a tutorial on a, a large, a large uh, section of NumPy and Pandas, and I really encourage you to go and read up about that if you're interested in working with it. But I've got a few snippets here if you just want to get started. So as you can see, I did take some demographic data. I looked at country and city because I thought that might be useful. In d uh, DVD rentals, perhaps people's movies tastes change from country to country. You don't know. So when you have a lot of data, sometimes you want to transform that and combine it. So for one person, maybe you just want to know what is their favorite movie. And I have a cute little snippet here for how to aggregate that data on customer. So I had demographic on city. I had some time features. How often do they rent? How long do they rent for? And you can maybe do some more things with that. And then I have some payment information. So the amount that they paid per DVD. This, as you would know, um, most businesses care very heavily about. It's always about the bottom line, isn't it? So I took one column amount and I turned it into a huge number of features. First, by rolling it up on date, presumably that's one order, and then per customer to get all of their orders together. And with that, I could get something like, um, the number of DVDs that they have per order, what's the maximum they've ever paid for per order, what's the average they pay per order, what's the total they've paid in their whole lifetimes. All right. And then finally, their preferences. And I thought this was going to be quite interesting and fun. And I encourage you to also go and get your hands dirty here. They've, we've got all the different uh, DVD categories. So you've got travel, drama, sci-fi, sports. I just tried to lift a few out here. We've got kids, sports, and foreign. I thought those could be interesting. Maybe, maybe not. And I just created that almost like a one hot encode where I just added a one when someone has rented that DVD category. Rolled it up on customer, and now we've got a favorite movie title, we've got a favorite movie category, but we also have an actor, but we also have whether they've ever rented kids' movies. Maybe you want to know who to email about your newest kids movie range, and this will now already give you a list of customers to target. Well, once we have all the data, we combine it. Um, here we have one hot encoding. So you can see here at the top, you have your category, your names, and then you have a, a bunch of ones and zeros, and this your algorithm will be able to deal with. So we combine them all into one massive data set, and we just check that there's no null values, so empty, empty data that can be a problem for your algorithm. And it's important to think about how you want to deal with that as well. Maybe you want to put an average value in there. Maybe you want to give something that's similar to a certain group. Um, I just dropped the values, but you can do different things with it. It's important to do a bit of data exploration as well. So it's good to visualize and get like a look at it. So 
I looked at the original features and I just made some plots here. This one is total customer lifetime value, something that a lot of companies care deeply about. And you can see here, you have a bit of a tail end of high, um, high spenders. These are your good customers, your VIPs. And maybe that's an important metric. You want to lift that out. Okay, let's go look at who these people are. What's their preferences? What do they like? How often do they spend? What's their average size of, like how many DVDs do they do at once? That kind of thing. Sometimes that can be quite a useful visualization. All right. Okay, now we get to the ML part. So first, we're not quite done with the data. The reason for that is, oh well, I'm gonna start with machine learning. That's the fun part, right? So we're going to be doing a clustering Right. We don't know who our customers are, so we can't say we're going to divide you into um, Betty's and Sarah's and Sam's. We don't know who they are. Who is this customer? We're about to find out. We're going to give them a label, and all that label is going to denote is that they're somewhat similar. And there's quite a few different algorithms that sklearn has to do this. I have spent some time trying different algorithms, and what they do is they will cluster them together, but they'll try and optimize different ways of clustering. For example, um, you'll have like a group with a center, and then it'll try and minimize the distance between all the points in that group to the center. Or it will try to find the best um, silhouette, like a nice demarcation for your group. Or perhaps it will try to space all your groups perfectly evenly. And which one you use depends on what kind of grouping you're looking for. At the very end of this notebook, there's a few different algorithms that I have played with, each with a small explanation. And what you can do is you can just plug, you can replace the one that I've used in this notebook with one of the others and see what it does. Just go and play around. And how you tell whether it's based is you have to use a score that will tell you how well your groups stick together. Is there a distinct grouping? I've used the kalinsky haraba score and the Silhouette score, um, which is commonly used for unsupervised learning. Let's get going. So the first thing that we have to do, this is what I was getting back, we are not quite done with our data. For example, if you have a lifetime value for a customer, that can go hundreds of rands, maybe thousands, I don't know. And then maybe the number of DVDs they've ever ordered, that's like 10, right? These are completely different magnitudes of order. If you feed that into your algorithm, it's going to go, oh, customer lifetime value is so much more important, which in this case it is, but you can't make this assumption. So you want to start at an even playing field. And for that, we standard, we normalize our variables. Then, the next step will be to reduce our feature set. We might have a massive feature set. You remember all those cities? Maybe you decided to keep them all, and you have 200 cities, 200 countries, 1,000 DVD names, etc., and it crashes your computer. So what I've dealt with is I used PCA. There was a PCA talk earlier this morning, but I was frantically uh, coding and tweaking, so I missed it. I'll have to catch it on YouTube. But basically, the way that I see it is, if you have a three-dimensional um, object and you take a 2D picture, you try to take it in such a way that the image is the most recognizable and it keeps most of the features of what you're trying to capture. Basically, you're reducing three-dimensional to two-dimensional. PCA does the same thing. It takes 700 features and reduces it to 35 or however many you choose while keeping that image as recognizable as possible, the data, the information. Now that we have a reduced set, we can throw it into our algorithm. So here's a bunch of numbers, and you can go play with them. Um, you can go and change init to 20, to 5, see what it does. I'm just going to store my IDs, because our customer IDs is not a feature, it's an identifier. And then, here's a normalized set. So now you can see they're all kind of small fractional numbers. And I tend to standardize those one hot encoded, those zeros and ones as well. Um, it's my personal preference, you don't have to do this. But it seems to me to give an indication to how common this, this, these little ones in the, in the column is. So if it, if it occurs often, it might be important, and that scales it to quite a large 
distance, whereas if you look at City London, it's 0 0.05. Clearly, there's not a lot of Londoners in the set. All right, time to plug it into our clustering algorithm. So I've done this iteratively, which is really good to help you optimize. So we don't know who our customers are, once again. So how do we know if there are four, five distinct groups, 12, 200? You don't know. Often this is limited by your business. So for our business, we couldn't look at more than six people. They just couldn't like distinguish. They say that people can only make good relationships with up to 50 people. Well, it seems like businesses can only talk to six people. So we, I um, iterated through a few different um, components, PCAs, tried to reduce them to any five features, 35 features, 45 features. And then I looked at different cluster sizes, three, six, and 12. And I looked at the description. How well does that 2D, well, 25D picture um, describe our full feature set? And it's 70% in our 25 features. For 35 features, it's 86%, which is pretty good. And 45 features, you've got 99%. But I'm going to try to reduce it to 35. So let's look at our 35. Here's our clusters. We've got for three clusters, we've got 24 score and a silhouette score of 0 0.05. This is not fantastic, let me tell you. Then we've got for six clusters, we've got a worse score for both. And then for 12 clusters, we've got a pretty good score for our Harabas and better for silhouette. So then this one here, maybe for a business perspective, we're going to go for three. So I ran it with 35 uh, features and three clusters. All right, let's look at them. Now we can visualize them the way that I've done it in our group is we do the, so the PCA, and we were talking about 3D, that's exactly what I do. I reduce all the features to three. And that makes it easy to just plot an X, Y axis. And then you add your labels as a color and you go and look, ta-da. You can actually see how well they group together. So blue and pink is nice and distinct, right? But yellow is kind of, Weird. Maybe it's like coming out of you at the pa uh, out of the page at you. We'll have to see. If I also look at our explained variance ratio of our three features, oh my goodness, that is terrible. These three features don't really tell you who your groupings are at all, and that's because this is a, a rough first model. So I like to do that. No weighting, no choosing of features. I just start with a base model and see what comes out, and then you can start to play and tweak. So probably I have a bunch of unimportant features that clutter up the place, it's really noisy, and when I reduce it, all I get is noise. It really doesn't show you who your customers really are. What you can also do is you can go and look at your previous features for each customer and then add them to your cluster labels and then go and plot your clusters versus some features. So here we've got total lifetime, on your x-axis and whether they rent kids' movies or not. So you can see the bottom line and the top line, they're quite similar, right? Clearly, whether they have children or not, it's not a big deal when they're renting DVDs. But there's a distinct cluster here for total lifetime amount, and it seems to be cutting off around 110. Maybe that's something significant. Maybe we want to go and look at a bucket of our customers that have less than 110 and customers that spend more than 110. So that's a feature you could go and create. I don't really know what I'm looking at here. <laughs> so <laughs> a third way that you could go and explore your data, which I've recently started working with, is I like to use uh, Google Data Studio. And that's simply because we use a lot of a Google Suite um, at work. So we've got Google BigQuery and, and various other services. And I find that it's quite nice to put your data into a dashboard because it's nice to share with a business and they can do filters and play around and interact with the data themselves as well. It's not as powerful as some data um, pro uh, visualization and dashboarding software such as ClickSense and Tableau, but it's free and I managed to sign up just with my normal Google account and get it working very easily. Right, so the fun part comes now. We have our base model, now we get our hands dirty. For example, we saw kids is not important, right? So you could either weight it down by multiplying it with a smaller scalar, or you could just get rid of it completely. Alternatively, we think total lifetime amount spent, that's pretty important, so you can multiply it with a scalar to increase the weight. 
Now you have to understand that at this stage, you're in introducing your own bias. Your base model might be a little bit difficult to understand. It's not really human understandable, but it is not biased. And now you're introducing business bias. However, if you're looking to talk to your, your customers about price point, then you have to bias it in price point because you need to understand that aspect of your customers. Here's some more algorithms for you guys to play with. I've got some Birch algorithms, Ward, agglomerative clustering, and all you have to do is you change your k, k means with your mini batch, or for example, your agglomerative. So I encourage you guys to go and try this yourselves. It's all set up and it should work. I'm also sharing this in, in a Google Drive file, and you could potentially run this in co-laboratory, where you don't have to set up Jupyter Notebooks at all or install anything. It should work just as is on uh, Google co-laboratory. So what do we do with this? Now we've got these clusters, they're like blobs, and some of them are slightly different. Um, what can we do with this information? And this is where the useful part comes in. You can create a general message, because already you can see who is your customer in aggregate, right? What do they use when they interact with you? What do they care about? What is the thing where they spend the most time, the most money, the most interest? And how do they spend their money? Do they like to buy? Uh, large numbers of small items, small numbers of large items. These kinds of insights can come out in distinct groupings for you. And you can also look at a general cluster and find perhaps this one person hasn't discovered something interesting that everyone else in that cluster really finds useful for them. So it also helps you to create new suggestions. You can also do a bit more of an individual focus. So instead of just having one marketing stream, now you can uh, individualize it to these clusters. You can speak to six or three or four different people. And you can say, hey, Laura, we've got project, um, product ABC at price point A. We think that you should look at this, and we can communicate through email, because that's what she likes to prefer. All right, that was over very quickly. Hey, it's the last talk of the day, so let's finish off. Any questions? Thanks a lot, <laughs> Cornelia. <coughs> really interesting things. There's a question over there. Run, run, run. Hi. Hi. Um, a question on the personas. Yes. Um, when you build them, are your personas built on your ideal customer, or do you actually do research and, like, I don't know, like user groups or, or to find out who the customers actually are and then, like, come up with the generalization from there? Very good question. Thank you. Um, it's kind of a mixture of different things. So at this stage, we went and we looked at our best customers. So we filtered our customers based on the customers who have bought repeatedly, have bought recently, and these are the customers that we would like to have more of. So we clustered those, and then we tried to assign our less engaged customers to those clusters to find out where they could potentially fit in. So that was one attempt that we, one approach that we had. But you can also just take, say, browsing behavior for us, because we are online and if you don't have buying behavior, and see how they clump together and see, based on behavior, what kind of behavioral clusters come out. So there's more than one way to do it. And then you can go online and you can look at known clusterings and ways of looking at things, and that can also influence the kinds of features that you use, what you weight, and how you look at your clusters. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Other one? Hi. Um, so, a question that I had was, um, how do you, I, I mean, obviously you've identified that these customers fit into these classifications, but then how do you, is that a database relation? Like, how do you actually put that into your system, and how often do you update that as well? Also a good question. Thank you. So, when you do your clustering, I'm going to try and get back to it. What you do is you create um, a prediction. Sorry, 
find it somewhere. My apologies. Um, here. You take your labels from your model. So your model will create groupings and then label them with something like zero, one, or two. It's not very descriptive. And it spits that out for you. And so now it's your job to go and interpret zero and look at zero. Oh, zero is Lara. Lara really likes to not spend a lot of money. She likes to be if affordable things. She likes these types of things. So that's up to the analysis afterwards. But you get that whole list of names and you, you just join them back with your I identifier, your customer ID. And then you save that into your database and you can now um, engage with these clusters, so cluster zero, filter on cluster zero, and talk to cluster zero through email and tell her, oh, we've got these affordable items. Um, does that answer your whole question? I think there was another part. How often? Okay, yes, thank you. Um, so what we did is we trained our model based on our current data, and I think we retrained the, the model only every like season. So it's based on our business, but we do assign new customers quite regularly. But I think it is, it's not, it's more to do with how our business grows and changes. So if our business has undergone quite a, a change or we've changed our strategy in talking to our customers and we think that the customers have responded in a new way, then it might be useful to recluster. For example, we're going through a merger with Spree right now and that's completely changed everything. So absolutely, now would be a good time to do a big overhaul, a new clustering, but then also only update for a little while until, say, six months later, and then see if new changes have come and whether we need to redo it. Thank you. Anything else? Other questions? Let, let me maybe ask one. So, uh, one else. Uh, over here. Um, I just yeah. want to find out uh, how do you action these insights? Uh, do they result in marketing, email marketing campaigns or yes. those kinds of things? Absolutely. And, uh, and then I assume you'd measure the effectiveness and does that feed back into the models? So at this stage, um, the last model we've used was a once-off because it had to direct our whole, whole campaign for migrating spree customers. So by the time that we've got some insights in how effective the model is, we basically through the transition period and we're actually moving on to like re-clustering the entire customer base. But um, I, I certainly think it's useful to look at the efficacy of, for example, targeted campaigns. Um, and it is something we're looking to do, is to see whether conversion rates on emails that are targeted versus generalized um, emails are more useful. However, um, I think we will, not at this stage, at least for this particular project, redo um, the clustering. Okay, okay so um, cool presentation. Thank you. Um, f we provide software for doctors, and the doctor has the patient as a client. Yes. Um, and what I'm thinking is, how would you approach trying to build personas? Um, no single doctor will have a large enough database to really be to, to do something, I think, great, maybe the bigger, the bigger intercares and people like that, but for the small doctor in the corner, they, they don't have enough data to train. Would you be able to build personas that would transcend uh, across kind of databases, or do you think that'd be a bit difficult, or maybe automate the persona to some extent? Um, any thoughts on that? That's, a, that's an interesting idea. Um, I would certainly give it a try. What I think I would do is I would try to get as much information around um, the doctor and maybe the patients and, and create almost like a, a combined persona of doctor and patient to see if there's some interactive features and, and unique uh, identifiers in how the doctor works. And that might help give you more data to more accurately combine them. Um, I think that at the same time, if you have few enough doctors, um, there is definitely value in aggregating because it will lift out interesting features that you wouldn't have seen if you just look at this whole list full of doctors, even if it's 200, which is not that much. So combining them into clusters can still give you useful insights. But at the same time, if your data set is somewhat small, um, maybe you can just combine it into one average. I think definitely try it out. Um, maybe the, the notebook will be useful for you too. 
give it a go. Thanks. Um, I just want to ask, what did you use uh, to for segmentation uh, before using this uh, data science modeling and stuff? So thank you for the question. We actually didn't do anything. It was really a gut feel. The, the marketing team thought who they wanted their customer to be and they directed all of their marketing out into the ether at this imaginary customer with no idea of who their customer was. And then they looked at price points and conversion rates to try and get a feel for how accurate that was. It's not that helpful and it's quite difficult to then get a direction. So it was all up in their heads, like, oh, edgy young people, yeah. And that's who they were talking to. But they had no idea the average age, what they bought the most, what they cared about, what brands. So uh, once we, even if you just go and take an average, like that already can give you, like just general, what's the most brands everyone buys? What's the most, um, like the category that most people buy? What's the price point everyone buys? That'll already give you almost like one cluster. Of who is your customer? And that's really a good place to start. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Sure. Um, I know you're playing at the toy data set here, but maybe, I'm not sure if you're allowed to, but um, have uh, discussed this, but have you looked into using like customer reviews and stuff to, to supplement your sales data in order to improve your, your models? And if, can you maybe talk a little bit about it if you have? That's a very interesting aspect. Thank you. So we, were, we had a huge time crunch for this last one. I mean, the merger just came and like blew over us like a hurricane. So uh, we had to use a lot of our existing features at this stage. We didn't even have browsing data. So definitely, I think our original clusters had a little bit of um, survey data. And what's fantastic about this is it really can tell you really important things about a customer. So absolutely. And I think maybe there's some interesting things to be done with NLP and um, that's something fun to play with. Absolutely. I think, um, for example, we're an online store. It could be very useful through our surveys to find out where they prefer to shop at brick and mortar. Because whether they shop at Ackermans or Woolworths or Edgar's, that could be really relevant to how we approach them. And that will come out more in their, their feedback and commentary, perhaps some social media. Um, so it, it could absolutely be some very valuable insights that we could add to our model. Hi, uh, another question here. Yeah. Um, do you ever separate your clusters into groups for like A-B testing or something like that? And if you do uh, at a website like Superbalist, how do you ensure that you don't have more, you don't happen to have more people in group B who log in while you're running this test than in group A? How do you deal with that if you do that? Uh, that's, a, that's also a very good question, and um, data scientists will know A-B testing is the final arbiter of whether you are actually having an effective model. And that's something we definitely can do better at Superbalist. Um, we're quite young as a company, and we have generated a huge number of models that are slowly becoming implemented, which is fantastic, but we still need to do a lot of um, looking back at it. So I think that we are currently developing ways of doing targeted clustering. So what you would do is you would have to create kind of like a, almost like an experiment, right? Where you would, for example, have targeted emails to a set number of people in each group and try and ra randomize it and have a control group as well. That's one, one example that I can think of. And so it's the number of people that you send your email out to um, you know, trying to control for certain things like how active this customer is and how recently they've shopped and things like that um, is one way that potentially you can try and eliminate like how many of them naturally would come onto your site for us. It looks like that's it's for questions. I can, I, can I maybe sneak one last question in? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm just very curious. So you mentioned before that the, the status quo was marketing intuition. Yes. How, how were these results received? Were they very different from the intuition? And, and did you, how did you sort of handle that, bridge that gap? 
So some of our intuitions definitely reinforced what they already thought they knew. Um, but other intuitions were new and definitely did not square with how they see themselves. Um, you find that the business has a certain way of doing things that they like and prefer. And when you sometimes come with new data and new insights, it's, it's kind of hard to, to kind of almost pivot into a new direction. But I think for us personally, we're quite lucky. We have a very data-driven business. Um, the CEO is very like, uh, focused on making sure that we action on insights, on real data, and not just on what we would like to think we are. So I think in that case, we're lucky. But I think it can be a real challenge. Um, in that case, probably A-B testing and showing like real results will be the most effective way. You need to obviously get them to let you um, do some, some tests, um, which can also be quite difficult to, to get your marketing emails in between their offering schedule. But if you can just get a little bit of data to reinforce, look, we had a 20% you know, uptake in revenue for this targeted email where against the, the normal brand, then immediately they will see, and I think they'll be more likely to, to come around. Um, let me also sneak in a question. Sure. What is your favorite clustering technique? Oh, and thank why? you. Okay, so I tried all the different ones, okay? Um, but my favorite is K-means. And it's the first algorithm I was introduced to um, by the legacy um, data scientist that handed over to me. He explained it in such beautiful detail. It was simple and easy to understand. And every clustering algorithm ever since has fallen short for me. So <laughs> K-means is my good old favorite. It's the hammer for every single nail. <laughs> but maybe there's something else better out there. It's just my sentimentality holding me back. I encourage you to try the others and let me know. Thank you. Well, let's give Cornelia another round of applause. And thank you.